Hello, my name is Janice B. Gordon. This is Scale Your Sales Podcast. Welcome to the Scale Your Sales Podcast, listed number nine of 42 best podcasts for every sales professional in 2021. I am Janice B. Gordon, the customer growth expert, recommended by LinkedIn as one of 15 innovative sales influencers to follow in 2021. In this episode, my guest talks about sales enablement and how it's important that companies create an ecosystem around sales enablement. It's not about having an SDR or a sales stack that does it. It's actually about integrating sales enablement across all of the relevant um, interfaces within organizations to make sure that the whole organization is a revenue generating organization. It's really interesting the points that my guests make. So you're going to absolutely love the amount of information you get listening to this episode. Over the last 15 years, my next guest worked as a sales enabler a seller, a buyer, and marketer for some of the globally most recognized names in B2B technology and online media. Today, he is host of the State of Sales Enablement podcast and the CEO of FFWD, a sales enablement consultancy firm specialized in optimizing the revenue performance of SaaS IT and media companies. So welcome to Scale Your Sales podcast, Felix Kruger. It's been an absolute uh, pleasure. I've wanted to get you onto the um, podcast for quite a long time. So I'm really excited about this. Janice, I, it's late over here in Australia, but I am excited and ready to go. Yeah, well, um, uh, let's get on with it then. So I'm particularly interested in sales enablement consultancy and the experience that you've had, because it's been one of those subjects that's just gained in popularity. So the experience you've had in terms of pre-pandemic, pandemic and post-pandemic, what has been the differences in the relationships that you've been talking about that your customers need to have with their buyers and what they need to do? Yeah. So I think it's safe to say that uh, B2B sales, especially in complex sales environments, have become harder, right? Just by the nature of not being able to communicate as effectively uh, through face-to-face -face meetings, but also through all the stresses that buyers go through in their private lives. You know, suddenly people might work from home for the first time in their careers. They might have the kids at home even. So they have to juggle, juggle all those different responsibilities and which makes it harder for sales reps to gain mind share within the sales conversations. So the, the, the overarching theme, I guess, from the changes that were required in B2B sales, um, especially in complex B2B enterprise sales, has been the efficiency in communication and the, the increase in efficiency in communication that was required to really gain traction and uh, get that mind share with buyers. And I think there were two key areas where that was done. Uh, number one, I saw a lot of organizations tightening up their, sell, uh, their value messaging. So they were revisiting revis what sort of value messaging they were delivering to the market, uh, make it as specific as possible to the sort of personas they were targeting and really making sure that the relevance as, is maximized. Yeah. And then the second uh, key area that I saw as a focus was uh, the uh, sales content side of things. Uh, sales content uh, has always been a topic and, um, you know, Anything that sales uh, do and say um, throughout the sales conversation uh, can be considered as co content. But uh, those more packaged content formats, such as videos, infographics, uh, interactives, that really make it easy for buyers to share information and to increase the relevance within the buying team across the organization that has really gained in relevance. And uh, Gartner has done research that was published just before the pandemic started, uh, which stated that only 17% of the buying team's time throughout the buying process is spent in face-to-face -face meetings. 
And if that was the case uh, pre-pandemic, pre uh, you can be sure that uh, that time has even decreased further. Uh, yeah, decreased further. So what that then means is that suddenly over 83% of the time is not spent in meetings with the seller. So you have to find ways to really package knowledge and uh, deliver information more effectively. And sales content has certainly played a big role in that. Yes, I found that that research really interesting as well, because that's the 17% across uh, sellers. So you might only get less than 5% of that. And so how can you really maximize the time with the, the buyer and actually give them what they need at that point in order to move them forward? Um, I wonder about personalization in that the B2B environment is taking on much more of the characteristics of B2C. And I've read much of your material and you've kind of said this as, as well. And so personalization in B2B and across the buying team, talk, talk to me more about that. Yeah, so buyer acumen is, you know, absolutely crucial these days. And uh, I've said that several times, and uh, that's that's something that I keep on advocating for in market as well, is that uh, buyer acumen is the uh, next big frontier for sales enablement, because uh, it is such a... Uh, competitive advantage if that gets done right and um, there's still very few organizations that actually nail that part you know there's there's few organizations that even go through the exercise of mapping out the buyer journey based on uh, research and interviews uh, and there's even less organizations that um, have a recurring effort to actually capture um, intelligence about buyers so they can adjust the way they interact with market over time uh, from a personalization point of view um, that is part of that. So it becomes more and more important to not only understand the internal champion, which is oftentimes the end user, if we talk, talk about software and IT, uh, but also understand the agendas of senior management who might be involved in the in the decision making. You know, there's not a there's hardly ever a single decision maker. It's oftentimes a decision making team and everybody uh, feeds in. So you have to understand as a seller. Uh, like what their agendas are and uh, what really matters to them. So from a personalization point of view, um, you know, having that business acumen and being able to effectively communicate with those people in meetings is really crucial. And I think a lot of times salespeople are not set up for success on that front, uh, because especially if you think about uh, the younger salespeople, especially if they're SDRs, uh, they might just be in the beginning of their career, might not have a lot of business experience, and they're being thrown in the deep end of the pool. And suddenly they have to interact with really senior people on the other side of the phone line. And they're essentially uh, brand ambassadors, right? And that they're the first point of contact um, that is associated with that brand name, possibly, right? So um, there has, really has to be an effort to enable those people and set those people up for success. The other angle um, on that front is also the content side of things, of course. Um, so you have to be more nuanced with your content as well and uh, really address the needs of different uh, uh, parts of the buying, uh, buying group. So how do you enable um, the SDRs, given that you've said that many of them are have less experience, they don't necessarily have the business acumen. And then on the buyer side, they want really hyper-focused information that's relevant to their particular need. And also um, is um, playing homage to what is the, the business drivers. So how do you bridge that gap? Yeah, it's um, uh, so first of all, from a sales enablement point of view, uh, you can put structures in place to actually, um, you know, put a process um, layer on top of that buyer acumen exercise. So it's not up to sales reps to individually figure everything out themselves. So sales enablement can play a crucial role in actually creating the structures that are required to uh, build that buyer acumen across the organization at scale. Right. So that's uh, really crucial to understand. Uh, from an SDR point of view, uh, how, how they would then acquire that knowledge uh, that would come down to the uh, communication channels that um, are most likely existent if you have a sales enablement program in place. So that's uh, things like the onboarding program and ongoing uh, training and coaching programs across the organization. So you would make sure that uh, 
they have that knowledge that is required, at least on a high level, uh, to have those conversations without uh, looking silly in front of senior buyers, right? And uh, I, I'm not advocating for SDRs by any means to become uh, business consultants. You know, I think that um, it's reserved for the more senior sellers that are um, involved later on in the process, but uh, that is certainly like the high level knowledge is certainly something that sales enablement can create for those organizations. And I've done that several times with my clients. So what that comes down to is essentially doing the, uh, the customer research, running interviews, um, understanding uh, what the buying process is, what the internal priorities are, what the KPIs are, but then also doing desk research uh, in order to identify what the high level industry trends are and uh, what sort of uh, trends should keep the buyer up at night that they might not even know about, you know? And um, th this kind of information can then be used in briefing sessions, uh, depending on the inter industry that would run quarterly or half yearly, um, where the sales team uh, gets updated on the kind of dynamic that they're facing in their target markets, so they can then um, adopt accordingly. Um, the other model that I also see um, being more and more advocated for is, uh, for full cycle salespeople, right? So in more mature markets, uh, when I say more mature markets, I mean more mature than the APAC region where you often uh, deal with uh, smaller markets and more fragmented markets. You don't have the same scale that you would typically have in Europe or in America. Um, in Europe and America, uh, there's oftentimes a structure in place with SDRs, um, you know, just to create efficiencies um, in the sales process. And uh, those prospects are then being passed on to AEs. Um, to then further lead the conversation in the Australian market. Um, it's, there's an attempt to replicate it oftentimes, especially from businesses who are entering the market after having operated in more, more mature markets previously. But I see organizations doing really well in actually implementing full cycle salespeople and um, the senior salespeople being involved very early on in the process and uh, doing the outreach and having those conversations early on with senior buyers. So um, those are the two ways, either uh, upskilling the sales force at scale by putting the structures in place or uh, just focusing on a small set of salespeople, but um, who are responsible for the entire sales cycle. Excellent, excellent. Now I'm interested in you, Felix, and what has been your route to where you are now with FFWD? So tell me more about that, because you're in Australia, but you don't sound like an Australian to me. That's right, that's <laughs> right. It's the, uh, I put that mysterious German exit on just to confuse uh, <laughs> listeners on uh, my podcast and all the other podcasts that I'm guest on. No, so I'm originally from Germany, as you uh, might have noticed, and uh, I uh, moved to Australia quite early on in my career after I um, graduated um, from from university in Germany. And I, um, in Australia, pretty much throughout my entire career, I worked in uh, IT, SaaS, and media, and um, always had roles that were related uh, to sales, um, including some sales roles. But um, oftentimes, I had a role that had a sales enablement component in it. Um, I worked for a big company here, a, a big media company here in Australia uh, called Fairfax Media, which is a uh, publisher um, of the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age and other big uh, publications. So um, in the UK, the, the, the equivalent pro would probably be The Guardian. Um, and uh, in, in, in that role, I was responsible uh, for enabling a sales force of 150 uh, people across the country. And I also um, was quota carrying. So I had a res revenue responsibility as well, and uh, a, a quite big one as well. <laughs> so um, I, I often have to smile when I hear about sales enablement roles that don't have revenue KPIs. Um, that, that used to be my re reality for years. And then I started my first uh, startup, which was uh, Witch 50 Media, was a digital transformation news website for senior executives, where we had an editorial team uh, talking about digital transformation trends across industries. And uh, then we worked with uh, sales and marketing teams from vendors in that space on upskilling them in the topics that are relevant to those senior executives. So they can have better conversations with senior stakeholders within the businesses that they were targeting and uh, uh, shorten their sales cycles accordingly. Um, and then I moved on to start now my second business after which 50 Media was acquired and uh, which is FFWD, which is a sales enablement consultancy, uh, which is 
uh, still, as far as I can tell, the only uh, pure play sales enablement consultancy in Australia. Uh, I haven't come across any others. And uh, we work uh, globally with uh, businesses in uh, SaaS IT and media in either getting their sales enablement uh, programs off the ground from scratch or uh, by increasing the capacity of their existing sales enablement programs. Interesting. So was it your first step into Australia, a job that took you out there or you actually went out to Australia and then no. got work? No, no, no. I came here just with a backpack and a dream. <laughs> <laughs> and you're still there with your backpack and your dream. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And a uh, wife and a son and a business. <laughs> <laughs> just a bigger backpack. Backpack. <laughs> that's right and, and, a, and a small one <laughs> yes exactly oh that's fantastic it's really interesting you know we're, we're in a global world and um i mean it sounds silly to say a global world but actually you know i'm in the uk we often you still come across very much island mentality and the pandemic has changed a lot of that when you think of businesses and they may be nationally trading businesses well everyone's international now everybody Absolutely. is global because we're all on, on on the internet so those barriers don't exist so um i find it really interesting when people kind of start out in in, in one place and uh, you know having Absolutely. all of the cultural challenges as as well as settling into a, another place it's it's fantastic yeah I, I i fully agree i think uh that's absolutely my experience the uh, time difference is literally the only limitation that i have within my business you know so we have a um a blind spot especially on the east coast of the us because it uh, almost seems to be impossible to find a, a decent overlap but apart from that we uh, we have clients in the uk we have clients in uh, dubai we have clients in uh, california you know we are not limited by um by location whatsoever because the interaction that i have with let's say somebody um in arizona is the exact same interaction that I would have with somebody down the road, you know, and uh, there's, there's cases where I have pe met people from overseas, uh, before I've met people here from Australia, you know, so those borders are certainly disappearing. Yeah, yeah, which is wonderful. But there are still um, borders, um, barriers within the um, sales industry, well, and across many other industries as well, in terms of diversity. And I'm interested in, in your, your view on, on diversity, and you, um, whether it's progressed or, or whether you feel there is more to be done. Yeah, I think um, I think my observation is that a lot of companies are making a, an active effort to increase diversity, you know, on all fronts and uh, be more considerate of the um, unconscious biases that they might have. Um, I think that is certainly changing, but there's uh, definitely a long way to go, especially from a, a leadership perspective. You know, you um, you still see. Uh, the kind of the same profile of leaders um, appearing um, over and over again. And uh, there is, yeah, there are exceptions to that, obviously, but um, I think generally speaking, there's still a long way to go. But then again, I, I think at the same time, um, if we think about sales, sales is actually a discipline that lends itself uh, most to diversity because it's very uh, performance focused. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it really comes down to, uh, you know, how well a salesperson performs uh, um, in order to, for that person to be successful. So I think um, sales might have a advantage compared to other disciplines, you know, like where somebody who might not necessarily uh, uh, fit that, uh, you know, middle-aged uh, white guy uh, profile, um, uh, you know, when that profile is not met, um, people might still be able to um uh get that exposure in front of senior leadership even though they might not have that same profile so i think yeah i think overall it's uh it's moving into the right direction but probably still a long way to go yeah yeah interesting yeah. so what's one tried and tested strategy you'd offer listeners to enable them to scale their sales felix so i think um as i said the uh, the buyer acumen side of things uh, that's definitely something that uh, should be the foundation of any high performing sales team and um, is the foundation from my point of view in each case for scale so any 
organization that I have interacted with over the years that was really high performing and growing fast um, made an, a proactive effort to uh, make that buyer acumen a big part um, of the organization and made an effort to update it on a regular basis. And that, as I said, uh, starts with mapping the buyer journey and then uh, gathering intelligence on a regular basis. The other aspects of uh, scaling your sales and the try to trust it uh, strategy that I would recommend is um, consider sales enablement as a way to align all the resources within your business to set your sales team up for success. You know, sales enablement is not a person or a team or a initiative. It is an ecosystem that you create across the entire organization. And the agreement across the organization that sales being a revenue generating function, which uh, apart from the vision that the company might have is ultimately um, the purpose of the organization is to generate revenue, um, to, to grow the business and um, to increase shareholder value. If you uh, consider that, you know, typically 20% of revenues are spent on sales and marketing in any given organization, uh, sales teams deserve to be enabled and set up for success. And, um, Sales enablement means that you create that ecosystem to align all the, the factors that contribute to success, including the buyer acumen, the technology stack that you introduce, the sales content that you create, and also the uh, training and coaching initiatives that you put in place um, to really um, nurture that, um, that success and uh, scale sales excellence across the organization. I'm really interested in the ecosystem of sales enablement. Where would you start with that if you're approaching the company and they have kind of very, you know, they might have a person or a department that is mm. that is labeled as sales enablement. Where mm. do you start to um, align the whole organization to create this ecosystem? Yep. So the most important part uh, to it is that uh, the sales leaders on board, you know, because, um, you know, sales leadership um, typically owns the uh, or is, is a, a major stakeholder in the go to market strategy. So you need to uh, get buy in on that front. So sales leaders uh, really want to make it happen and not only talk about it, but really uh, be committed to it. Uh, that's number one. Number two is senior executive sponsorship. Uh, so uh, depending on the size of the organization, you would uh, talk to the CEO um, or to the chief revenue officer. Um, that sponsorship is really required to then uh, get the other department leaders on board. You know, um, Seeing that uh, senior leadership is really committed uh, to sales enablement will make any follow-up conversations easier. And then you essentially um, uh, build that buy-in by engaging those department leaders across all the uh, sales adjacent departments, such as uh, marketing, HR, um, IT, customer success. You talk to all those department leaders and um, uh, communicate what you want to achieve and agree on uh, what a positive outcome uh, for sales enablement would look like and how their departments can contribute and how that feeds into their in individual department goals. And uh, that is the most crucial exercise um, to make sales enablement happen. I think the worst case scenario for sales enablement is a effort where a junior sales enablement person is being hired with hardly any experience who is not able to create that alignment across the organization because uh, sales enablement is only... Um, as good as the contribution from all the other departments, you know, and the uh, the saying in the sales enablement world goes, enablers can can do anything, but they can't do everything. And uh, that is um, absolute reflection of that sort of dynamic. So, uh, yeah. I, I, what I've seen in many organizations is um, the growth of the sales stack. And uh, in, instead you might have a, through a few junior SDRs but then what they do is they're throwing more technology at it, thinking that that's going to be solving the problem. I don't know if you've seen this as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think there's certainly a, a sales tech boom going on. Um, you know, there used to be this, uh, the MarTech landscape, uh, which is a graph uh, combining all the marketing technology logos. And then you always had the year on year comparison and uh, could see this explosive growth. I've lost track of uh, that graph in particular, but I certainly see the same dynamic happening in the sales tech space. And I think there's a certain gold rush happening and there's a big promise of uh, creating sales efficiencies uh, to enable uh, scale um, across sales. But I think uh, the approach to sales tech is often not contributing to sales tech success. You know, the, um, if you 
um, if you try and find a problem for the tool that you've bought, um, you've got a problem, right? If you are creating a major administrative overhead for your sales team without gaining much benefits, then you're creating a problem because you um, eat into the time of the sales reps, right? So I think the, again, the most crucial exercise businesses can uh, have to go through is to map out the buyer journey and then base everything that you do on that, including sales tech. So you um, see where sales tech can uh, reduce friction um, throughout the, buy the selling process um, in interacting with buyers. And then um, you also see how sales tech can con contribute um, uh, reducing friction during sales processes. You know, so those are the, the key areas. But I think a lot of businesses don't approach sales tech in that strategic way. They still are excited about um, that new shiny toy that somebody's pitching to them and say, oh, that, that could work for us. Um, but they don't have that strategic lens um, on introducing tech that way. And I see it over and over again. Uh, you know, being new to client com uh, conversations and new to client organizations and reviewing their sales tech stack and uh, seeing so much redundancy in there and so much wasted budget um, that could be better spent elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So who is your hero or shero, Freelance? Well, I would have to say my shero is my mother, for sure. Um, so my mother used to be a primary school teacher in Berlin, Germany um, for her entire career. And uh, she really made a big difference in a lot of uh, children's lives. So she uh, still receives calls uh, from some of her students for her birthday, uh, you know, 20, 30 years after they sat in uh, her classroom and she uh, taught them how to read and write. Uh, yeah, I think she's definitely my, my shiro. I also want to make a difference uh, for the uh, people that I interact with, you know, uh, not only my client, but all stakeholders of my business. Uh, I'm not sure it is as tangible as it would be for my mother, but uh, that's what I strive for anyway. Brilliant. Excellent. So how can listeners get hold of you? Yeah, so you can find me on LinkedIn 24-7. Uh, I'm based in Australia, which means nobody cares about my time zone, so I stopped caring too. I'm on LinkedIn whenever you need me. Uh, posting content. Uh, I run a podcast called The State of Sales Enablement, uh, where I interview senior sales and sales enablement leaders around the topic of strategic sales enablement. And uh, the website of my business is uh, goffwd.com. That's goffwd.com. If you're interested in finding more about uh, sales enablement and uh, our sales consulting services, uh, please uh, make sure that you um, visit us there. Excellent. Thank you so much for being a guest on Scale Yourselves podcast. Felix, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janice. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Scale Your Sales podcast. If you like this discussion, feel free to listen to other episodes or watch the caption show on YouTube and subscribe to future episodes. I would really appreciate it if you would leave a positive review on iTunes. Thank you.